Hey, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast All Day. We're back. It's another week, and we all got through it. Christy, Matt, Alonzo. Um, Christy's got that list of the news headlines, and she's going to tell us about them. I do. So another week and more breaking Britney Spears news. Um, it seems that, first of all, there's a giant story in The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. There's a huge, huge piece. Like I had the tab open on my laptop for just days and would just like dip into it and then like go do laundry or take my kid to swim practice or something like that. Huge long story with many, many insider interviews into what all is going on with Brittany. But even after that came out, we've got developments constantly with her conservatorship, her longtime manager, Larry Rudolph, who worked with her for like 25 years, has resigned amid reports that she has just retired from entertaining in general. Also her lawyer saying Sam Ingham has left. And so I don't even know what the status of things is anymore. It all seems like it's in flux and whatever passionate appeal she made to the court um, is just out there and no changes have been made. Yeah, this is, you know, I, I think it, it, what, we, what we're seeing now is basically the, 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 the people whose position is no longer tenable, you know, in other words, like they, nobody can claim, oh, gee, I didn't know, because now we all know, like now so many of the details are coming out. So you basically are on board for this, or you are not. And so I think a lot of the people who had plausible deniability before, maybe, or maybe they didn't know or whatever. Now they're like, yeah, I can't be part of this. I think I feel like I read something that the judge had finally ruled that the conservatorship will stay in place as it is. But then there's another hearing on the 14th where I believe that she's that Spears is then now asking to dissolve it rather than change it. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's another hearing coming up. Um, but, yeah, it all sounds shitty. Like she's paying her father's lawyers to fight to remain in control. Like, ugh. it's just gross. Yeah, this is, there's, there's a weird Victorian novel thing about this mm -hmm. where like, you know, she's the heiress who's being like, you know, they, they, they've locked up in an asylum or something yeah. like it's there. It, it's all very weird. And it just gets into weird control issues. And the other thing is <laughs> like, there's so, I mean, look, like there's so much sexism involved, right? Cause this would, well, yeah. it, it is, it is it is really hard to imagine that this would happen with a male star yep. like Erratic nobody ever did that to Michael rock and roll what like nobody ever did that to Michael Jackson yeah. right like there's all kinds of people that all kinds of dudes that had questionable behavior but nobody ever did that to them that we know of yeah. right um, speaking of women being treated poorly this uh, Olympic sprinter Shakiri Richardson cannot compete because she tested positive for weed mm. and there's been just this massive outcry from people in support of her like Seth Rogen like Dwayne Wade Seth Rogen had a really funny tweet saying you know clearly this is all about racism and it goes back a long time but also if weed made you fast then I would be Flojo yeah, yeah exactly. I mean <laughs> like it's the opposite of a performance enhancing substance <laughs> right like she tested for weed like that should make it even more exciting to watch. Yeah, it. That's like, like, that's like playing golf with a handicap. On, right. Like <laughs> I get it. If it was like, Oh man, she was high on Coke. Like, Oh, okay. Right. But yeah, this is, uh, yeah. And I, I believe if I understand correctly, she said that she used it because she was dealing with the remorse of her mother's death. Yes. And so yeah. but you who know, cares it, why she used it? Who cares? Like, who cares? Who gives a shit? It? Yeah. It, it's this ongoing thing of like, let's not treat athletes like human beings, whether it's, you know, the tennis player who didn't want to do the press conferences. Naomi Osaka. Exactly. It's like perform or else. You right. know? It's, and, the IOC is just mad they didn't get a piece of the money involved in it. Right. Uh, like the only thing that they're upset about is that any possible sponsor that would say, oh, well, she's a pot smoker. She's on weed for some reason. We don't want to. We don't want to put our money in here. That's the only thing the IOC gives a shit about. Mm. That's it. Right. Those Why guys are out. Dispensaries should be lining up. Yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah, she should get some sort of awesome endorsement deal. Um, speaking of the Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics are beginning really soon, but there will be no spectators 
for any of the events. They had already said that nobody from other countries can come and watch, right? Only <laughs> Japanese people or people who live in Japan can go and watch. And then they said, okay, you can't have anybody lining the marathon route cheering on the runners. So that already was like a surreal thing. Like when you're doing a race, especially something like that, you need people to help yeah. push you along and get through it. And now every single event will have nobody cheering. So you're going to hear like every thump, every time Simone Biles lands one of her, her perfect tumbling passes, it's going to be like thump, 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 thump. <laughs> every volleyball hit. It's going to be so strange. Oh, every by the splash. way, speaking of racism at the Olympics, have you heard the whole swimming cap scandal? Oh, if you have um, dreads, like 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 African Americans with longer hair. Yeah, there are particular kinds of swimming caps that are meant to accommodate black hair, black hairstyles that the International Swimming Federation had originally banned, but now they say they're going to reconsider. But it's like, oh yeah, yeah. This this just takes me back to like, was it Venus Williams in the cat suit? Like, right? Why why are we constantly like jumping on this dumb stuff and just like let athletes do because the thing people that they want to do. are assholes <laughs> and they don't like change and change Clearly is threatening not. and when change comes in the form of a woman or a person of color is even more scary much less both. asshole conservatism yeah. we don't like to change <laughs> so also um the city of tokyo is in a state of emergency so woohoo perfect time welcome right. athletes jesus like godzilla could come around and stomp around the <laughs> olympic venues and they'd still be like well we're still gonna have the games mm. right it's, it's, it's tradition um right. michael avenatti was sentenced this past week stormy daniels former lawyer michael avenatti oh yeah. remember him and and he was on <laughs> so many TV, players but he was on he was adored. He was on TV like constantly on MSNBC, like every night. Rachel Maddow had him on a lot. Lawrence O'Donnell had him on a lot. There were like glowing, like New York Times style pieces about his sartorial excellence and those mm. piercing blue eyes and those jagged cheekbones. And there was talk of him running for president because he happened to be <laughs> this, you know, really snarky and biting Trump critic. And he was Stormy Daniels' lawyer. And then he tried to extort nike out of like 20 million dollars yeah uh, more than 20 million dollars he tried to extort nike and that's what he was um sentenced for he was only sentenced to two and a half years is it milkshake duck is that what it's called yes. when like everybody on the internet falls in love with somebody and then yep. like five minutes later we find out like the worst the milkshake stuff. duck is oh has what a history of racism yeah it was like an onion piece or something where like yeah, you know like internet falls in love with milkshake duck oh milkshake duck has nazi ties you know like yeah <laughs> right so when somebody blows up big and then a couple days later or even hours later you find out like oh Ooh. You know, yeah, like, that's like, like, like when uh, there was shrimp in my cinnamon toast crunch and then it turned out, oh, you're like a spousal abuser or like something terrible <laughs> along those lines. Like, mm. Or if there's some like really nice video of someone doing something awesome, like on the subway and if one falls in love with them and you realize, oh, like they're a white supremacist. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Milkshake duck. Milkshake I didn't realize duck. there was an oh, actual yeah. term for this. <laughs> yep. So funny. Um, speaking of people who we used to like and maybe don't anymore. Um, Ricky Gervais says That's a big that long list. <laughs> it could be anyone. Ricky Gervais says in an interview with the BBC that the office couldn't get made today because it would be canceled. Now, what actually did he say? Because I've seen people say that, that if you look at the actual quote right, in the interview, right. that he gives a more measured thing, basically saying that like people would complain about the show or something, but not so much that you couldn't make it or that it would, you know, be automatically. Because the thing is, yeah, that lead character is an idiot and says all the wrong stuff, but the whole point of the show is to constantly like him getting called out for all of his right. awfulness. It's satire. It's called satire. Right. Like Archie the, Bunker. <laughs> right. The problem is, is that Gervais is a prick. And so <laughs> yes. that's that's why it would get canceled is because people will be all up in his business and saying that, oh, the jokes he's making are hypocritical because look at the way he lives his life. So, yeah. you know, and the stuff he says off camera. What he said was more nuanced than like the yeah. Twitter blurb. But yes, he is that still is a true. prick. Let me be clear about that. That is true. <laughs> um, there will not be a season two of Lovecraft Country. Boo. Boo, but I'm okay with that. Like, I, I'd rather have them not do one than do than one that do sucks. it badly. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess. I just, I don't know. I think there's, we have an interesting history of, particularly on HBO, 
shows based on books where once they move beyond the book, it really gets cracking. Like I think the leftovers got better after season one. I think Watchmen is an example of this where it's like, okay, we, we, we did that story now let's, you know, so I, I'm a little disappointed. I, I really I like would that throw cast Game of Thrones uh, as a rebuttal to that. Well, but aren't those books that aren't, haven't been written yet or something? Yeah. But that's the thing. Like they got past where the books were and then gotcha. it was like, Oh, okay. Ugh. Yeah. Fair I enough. believe we had a conversation after the Lovecraft Country finale where we said, if this is it, that's okay. Because yeah. it's really satisfying. So true, true, true. I just, I think that it just, there is this history of, it, certainly even in recent years, like, like you look at Netflix and stuff, where you have these shows that are predominantly featuring and about and, you know, under you know like created by people of color and then they don't get picked up whereas like other ones do that are have similar ratings or at similar budgets you know so that's that's the only part that kind of chafes for me okay um speaking of new programming rupert murdoch is oh, debuting God. fox weather I can't with this. I'm so curious to see like how much climate change denial is going to exist. It's, it's got to be more than just like it's going to be hot in the valley today. It's got to be. It's got to be more like it's going to be like, Steve Martin with his pre-taped uh, yeah, from forecast LA from LA Story. <laughs> Yeah, like they oh, want you to think it's hot in the valley today. Put a sweater on to own the libs. I, like, <laughs> I don't even know. Exactly. I'm, I mean, supposedly it's just like because they realize, oh, weather is a constant that your political alignment can vacillate depending on who's in power. Ugh. But everyone needs to know what the weather's going to be like outside. We don't have enough of a propaganda outlet in every old person's home. Right. We like, need to invade another channel that they'll leave on all day and be brainwashed by us. I, I, yeah. Like, I love that there's an idea in that circle of people like Murdoch who's like, well, shit, we got to start telling people that the weather is not that bad. <laughs> or, well, but it's terrible. And we're today. all losing money. Is it yeah. Antifa's fault? You know. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> Man, Black Lives Matter is in charge of, uh, yeah, they're the ones responsible for climate change, right? <laughs> could you, oh, here could comes you... another storm. Watch out, because it's the Black Lives Matter storm. That's, yeah, that's what's going to happen. Could your AV, HVAC repairman be Antifa? Tune in and find out. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Is your thermostat <laughs> spying on you? <laughs> Probably. Is it Big Probably. Tech? Is it Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That is all interesting. George Soros uh, <laughs> is behind it all. Right. Going back to coal stoves is patriotic. <laughs> um, speaking of, do you see, do you see that clean, clean coal? Do you clean see coal, that yeah. Trump is suing Twitter and mm -hmm. Facebook and Google saying that it's a class action lawsuit, which makes it sound super official. Uh -huh. And he's suing because his First Amendment rights have been infringed upon. <laughs> now, the worst part of that is that corporations are not held to. The worst part of that is that the Wall Street Journal let him do an op-ed around it. And that's, uh, yeah, like, that's fucked up. It's my understanding that he filed uh, the Facebook lawsuit, at least in the wrong state, that like you he, you would have had to have filed it in California and not Florida or something. I don't know. I, I... Did he file in Florida because he lives in Florida? But I Facebook think so, is, yeah. Facebook I've been trying to pay as little attention as possible to this. But... They're all based in California. All three of those yeah. platforms are all based here. Yeah. I mean, he probably filed it in the papal states, knowing him. Like... <laughs> <laughs> um, Quentin Tarantino is buying the Vista Theater. Okay. Sure. And we'll show movies only on film, as he I, does at the New Beverly. An interesting topic that... Uh, Maria Gates, who Matt knows, she's work, work around Tomatoes, and and she's great. Uh, she's a great film Twitter follow if you aren't already. But she was like, the thing about the thirty-five millimeter thing, it's like, okay, yes, on one level, great. That's you know how films were meant to be seen, yada, yada, yada. But like in recent years, we've been getting a lot of amazing four K restorations of films that are not necessarily like giant audience friendly. You know, they're made by female directors, by people of color. They're queer films. They're obscure foreign films. And unless there is somebody bankrolling the not inexpensive process of converting that 4K restoration into a 35 millimeter print, limiting yourself to 35 millimeter is in a way limiting yourself to a very certain kind of film aimed at a certain kind of audience. 
And, you know, if you ask any archivist, you, you talk about the movies that fall between the cracks are the ones that, you know, Sony or Warner Brothers, whoever, aren't making any money on, you know, because they were indies, because right. they were experimental, because they were, you know, from, you know, non-white, non-male, non-straight directors. Like, there's a lot of different things that go into that. So it's like, yes, seeing movies in 35 is great, but who decides what gets rendered to 35 is a conversation that I think is worth having if Tarantino is going to continue this into more and more theaters. And it's, who curates it? Who is it the same <clears throat> people who curate the New Beverly? I, I imagine he, a lot of it will be his decision-making and his collection, frankly, yeah. the, the, where these stuff, where this stuff comes from. But and if he, guys, go ahead. No, no, I'm but, saying if he turns around and says, hey, I'm going to like start this foundation where we are going to strike 35 prints of XYZ films, whatever, like, then that's great. And I, I would love to see that. But in the meantime, I think there is a, you're right, there's a very, there's a pipeline here that we're looking at. But there's I was going to mention really fast, if I could, just for those of you who don't live in California or in LA, the Vista yes, is like a, it's a one screen theater in Los Feliz in like sort of the, Kind of near Hollywood, part of, of Los Angeles. It's the theater they go to in True Romance. Okay, that's a good way to put it. If you know from that. Uh, okay. The the thing that bothers me about the way some people look at at their insistence on only shooting on film and like anything not shot on film is like to the point that you will see people react like, oh, well, that wasn't shot on film. It's not a real movie. Or it can't, you know, it wasn't struck to a, a film print. That's not a real experience. Is that that's a mindset that I absolutely don't agree with. And I think that it's short-sighted because it, it it's from a position of people that have been able to get the financing to make something on film and get the fucking film developed, which is a huge cost, right? Whereas memory is cheap and you can shoot something on digital and it gives you so much more freedom. And you have so many people that are able to make independent productions because they're shooting on digital and to act like that's not the real experience and the fact that sometimes yes that stuff will only get shown digitally because that's the way it's it, like that's the technology i think that's shitty i think that's short-sighted and mean, i think it's elitist yeah it look it's it's great that he wants to keep 35 alive and i i admire that i respect that but when you get into an only this not that mentality you know the reality is most movie theaters in this country have abandoned 35 millimeter projection. They have taken out their 35 millimeter projection and only do digital. So it's like all these 35 millimeter prints, there's like a couple dozen, I mean, maybe 50, I'll say under a hundred for sure places in the United States probably where they can still be screened commercially and publicly. And so it does become this weirdly sort of elitist thing. And it's like, I'm not saying he shouldn't be championing 35 and trying to promote it and all that stuff. But when you're like no digital, none, it's only 35. Then like that is, that means that there are lots of places in the country that might want to see this this film that you've that you've got and cannot because you know they they can only get it digitally and i don't know it just it's there's a lot there, there's a there's a longer discussion to be had here and i need to go back and watch that documentary that is it the keanu reeves narrated it right where he, they talked to like nolan and cameron and all these contemporary filmmakers about film versus digital and yeah. what the difference is and what they prefer and and apparently like it's 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 not as cut and dry as one might think i mean i i appreciate that he feels like his calling is preservation, right? Sure. There is that. And there are, and, that. and the vast majority of places do project films digitally. And so maybe his his thinking is like there are lots of other opportunities in other locations to see these kinds of movies and I'm gonna carve out my little niche with my little stuff and I'm I'm contributing to the history of film in this way. That's yes. probably his thinking. Anyway, um can has begun Mm. The new Leos Carax, um, Annette. We're going to talk about the Sparks documentary later on today, but the, the movie has music from Sparks and it has Adam Driver singing while in between Marianne Cotillard's legs. And uh, well put. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't <laughs> sing right? in that? It's magical. Situation. And uh, and so, you know, I guess in some ways it feels like things are returning. People are posting pictures of themselves dressed in tuxedos to go mm. to movie premieres and all that. Um, so does it make you want to see Annette? Are you guys curious? 
I, I have been wanting to see in that. Um, what's funny is the the way where people are talking about like, oh, what about its Oscar chances? Blah blah. blah. And I'm like, y'all, this is a Leos Carox movie. <laughs> like it never had Oscar chances, no matter what stars are in it or who did the music or whatever. I mean, if it does, get something great. But like this guy, this is the guy who made Pola X and Holy Motors. Like mm-hmm. he is hardcore art film guy, you know. And so I, I'm, I'm, I've been. This is, I think, his first film since Holy Motors, right? So I've been excited about that. Uh, but yeah, like the, it's the, this conversation that comes up every year where we try to marry Cannes' particular set of aesthetics and you know what their idea of what cinema is versus like how's it going to do at the box office and what are the I Oscar mean, chances? It's like, no, that's why are we why why are we? It's having early July. I hate yes. this conversation. <laughs> um, also, speaking of avant-garde filmmakers, Robert Downey Sr. died this week. Yes, R.I.P. Yes, at age 85, he was suffering from Parkinson's there toward the yes. end. So uh, wait, did, Rich, did, did we talk about Richard Donner last week? I was No, I was saving it. Okay. Sorry. I was saving it because I want to talk about the fact that he's our off-the-menu poll. We can do it now since we're here. Sure, sorry, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I have it stacked. It's called stacking. <laughs> and I've ruined everything. <laughs> Richard Donner died. He was 91. Yes. Um, and he is our off the menu this month. If you are uh, one of our Patreon members, you get to vote on which Richard Donner movie that uh, at least one of us hasn't seen that we will review that will also be exclusive for our subscribers on Patreon. Uh, Goonies and The Omen are on that list because somebody in this room hasn't seen those movies. Not so. me. I've seen them. I've never seen The Goonies. What can I tell you? Um, <laughs> I have seen The Omen. It, it didn't come up. I think I saw it a very long time ago, so it'll be new to me as well. Um, I also wanted to throw out real quick, a, a director named John Ehrman died, um, who, like Donner, got his start in uh, television. They both, I think, directed episodes of Star Trek, the original series. Um, Ehrman pretty much stayed in TV. I think he only had one theatrical feature. But um, he worked on, like, Roots and Roots the Next Generation. He did the made-for-TV um, Streetcar Named Desire with Anne Margaret and several other uh, Anne Margaret uh, TV movies. And he did two uh, big kind of breakthrough films about, or actually three rather, big breakthrough films about AIDS. Uh, he did an early Frost uh, with Aidan Quinn and Jenna Rollins, which was I think the first. Oh, made I remember that. That's yeah, yeah, where I a... first saw Aiden Quinn, I think. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah it was pretty, that. pretty yeah. early in his career. So, yeah, so he did that one. He did a film called Our Sons with um, Julie Andrews and Anne Margaret and I think Hugh Grant. And then a film, uh, he did a, a Hallmark Hall of Fame in the 2000s called The Blackwater Lightship, which I think is one of the best TV movies ever made. It stars Angela Lansbury and Diane Weist. I highly recommend you check it out. I think it's on Amazon Prime. But anyway, so, yeah, so we lost three big directors this week. Um, I have some mindless celebrity romance news. Please. And then we can wrap up and move on. Um, Tom Holland. Yes, Matt? Well, I feel like we didn't really talk that much about Richard Donner. Like, we I mean, just, we're going to. That's, right. what, that's what the author menu is for. But yeah, sure, no, we can. Right. I, I just think, like, Donner was a very influential filmmaker, especially through the 80s. Um, and I think we've all seen a bunch of him. Like, I don't think Lethal Weapon would be, I mean, I don't think Mel Gibson would be quite where he is without Donner's casting him in Lethal Weapon. True. Uh, yeah. And certainly I think the, the, the superhero genre that is currently dominating global cinema right now, without Donner having directed Superman and producing the first X-Men movie would not be where it is right now. And just right. such an eclectic array of films. I mean, like a lot of them were genre films, whether they were like, Horror, like a lot of the, the TV stuff he did, he did one of the most famous Twilight Zone. Episodes yes, Nightmare 20,000 Feet. Ever. Um, so whether it was horror or action or sci-fi or comedy, like it was a lot of different kind of genre stuff, but all striking and fun and smart and exciting. His Superman and- is still the best film version of Superman that we've seen oh, yeah. yet on film, far and away. And speaking of TV movies, you might remember, Christy, he also directed 1975's Sarah T, Portrait of a Teenage Alcoholic, starring you know, Linda Blair. Starring Linda Blair and a young pre-Star Wars Mark Hamill. And That's right. Yeah, yes. post-Exorcist Linda Blair and pre-Star Wars Mark Hamill. And I've never seen it. Oh. And I Shout- need to see it. Shout Factory did it a, like a DVD or a Blu-ray a couple years back. It's, you know, it, it, it's that 70s TV movie thing of like it's topical and it's a little bit exploitative, but it's also sensitively handled and well acted and yeah you should check it out okay 
Um, yeah, so we will. As opposed guess... to mazes and monsters, was that the name of that movie? <laughs> yeah, the eighties version name. that's not sensitively handled. Ooh, God no. Um, so we'll talk more about Richard Donner in a few weeks when we do our off the menu. So if you guys are our Patreon friends, please make sure that you go on there and vote. Every vote counts. Um, also, in production, before I talk about celebrity romance stuff, um, it was announced that Greta Gerwig is going to do a Barbie movie starring Margot Robbie as Barbie. Like that the was, I, is the Margot Robbie part of the news? Because I remember she and Bombach were attached to a Barbie movie a while back. Yeah, and so Margot Robbie is going to, I think, produce and star in it. Anyway, okay. That was out in the world today on Twitter. And that's one of the one of those kind of movies where like uh, you know you tell me this is a Barbie movie I'm like eh you tell me it's Greta Gerwig's Barbie movie I'm like okay well I would look and at Margot Robbie like she picks interesting stuff to do so absolutely sure. yeah it'll be smarter and probably weirder than <laughs> it would be in a lot of people's hands than the Bratz movie let's say right. okay so Tom Holland and Zendaya photographed making out in a car. After years of denying they were a thing, maybe they weren't a thing before, but they are now, which makes all of that Peter they Parker can't and MJ hotel stuff. Room? Well, they were excited <laughs> to see each other, I suppose. I don't know. So that was one thing. Um, Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani finally got married. They've been together. They've been engaged for like six years um, or for a while. And they got married at their ranch in Oklahoma where they have their own chapel like on the grounds of the ranch in Oklahoma is a chapel. Game you for can them. take the girl out of Orange County. <laughs> right. And so there's that. Um, Jason Sudeikis, this is not news, I guess, is dating Keely. I don't know. Is it, is it Hazel or Hazel who plays Bex on Ted Lasso? The young, beautiful new Rebecca on Ted Lasso. Remember at the, I binged Ted Lasso yes. for you guys. Yes. I know, the but you seen him new girl. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Oh, oh her. Oh. The, the one who gets together with the, the new Rebecca. Right, 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 right. Okay. Jason huh. Dacus is dating her. They were also in Horrible Bosses 2 together. Um, they have a oh. photograph walking arm in arm and enjoying life together. Okay. Um, Scarlett Johansson is pregnant. That happened. With Colin, Colin Joe's baby. Okay. Because they're married. Um, this makes for Scar Jojo, by the way. Scarlett Johansson oh God, and Colin right. Jost. <laughs> um, Scar Jojo. Yes. He ain't hyphenating. Have we talked about Nick Carter having like, what, seven kids this year? Or seventh kid? He's had like... Like from the Backstreet Boys? Nick Carter? No, not Nick Carter. Uh, who is it? The the one that was... Shit, now I can't remember You and name. McGregor? No, no. He yes, just had a kid. He just had a kid with uh, Mary, Mary Elizabeth, Elizabeth Winstead. Winstead. That was last week's celebrity. Sorry, right. yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> who was? Uh, I'm blanking. Who was in Glitter? Um, Mariah Carey. And who used to no, date Nick? Uh, Nick Carter. No, wait. That's what I said. Nick Carter. Nick said Carter that, sorry, is in the no, Backstreet Boys. No, you're right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon. <laughs> sorry. He got Nick my Lemire. with that. I couldn't. Really like, Nick Lemire has had like seven kids. <laughs> Nick Cannon, yes. Nick Cannon, yeah, has like a million kids. Or he's had like something like three or four kids just in the last year. He has twins with Mariah Carey. And he's always got like four TV shows on at a time. So he's, I don't know when he sleeps. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Is that, it? Is that all I have for you? I think it's all I have for you. Oh, also, Summer of Soul, which we talked about last week, got an A plus cinema score the rare a plus cinema nice score. good so for those who got the pleasure of seeing it in a the theater they loved it there you go that's all i got all right well uh thanks everybody for watching we appreciate it uh like this video subscribe to our youtube channel check us out at be fast all day on twitter instagram and facebook and yeah do drop over to our patreon page at patreon.com slash be fast all day get your vote in on which richard donner classic we'll be talking about later this month also we are uh coming around the bend on loki which had a real doozy of an episode this week we'll be talking about and coming up ted lasso season two so lots of fun stuff exclusively for our subscribers you don't want to miss it um until next time, take care of yourself and each other. Bye. Bye.